All right, as folks are continuing to join in, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, I'm Julia with Politics and Prose. We're live with Keith Gesson and Megan K. Stack discussing Raising Rafi the first five years. You can find a link in the chat column to purchase the book directly from Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll move to questions in the last portion of the discussion, but we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm excited to introduce this great new book, Raising Rafi examines the profound, overwhelming, often maddening experience of being a dad, tracing how the practical decisions made each day intersect with some of the weightiest concerns of our age. By turns hilarious and poignant, Raising Rafi is a story of what it means to invent the world anew. Author Keith Gesson has also written A Terrible Country and All the Sad Young Literary Men, and is the founding editor of N Plus One. He has translated or co-translated from Russian the work of Lyudmila Petrushevskaya, Kirill Medvedev, and Nobel Prize winning Svetlana Alexievich's Voices from Chernobyl. A regular contributor to the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, and The New York Magazine, Gessen teaches dirt journalism at Columbia and lives in New York with his wife, the novelist Emily Gold, and their two sons. And moderating this evening is Megan K. Stack, a former war correspondent and the author of Woman's Work, A Personal Reckoning with Motherhood, Labor, and Privilege, as well as Every Man in This Village is a Liar, which was a finalist for the National Book Award in 2010. She has written for the New York Times Magazine and the New Yorker, and is currently a contributing writer for the Times. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Keith Gesson and Megan K. Stack. Thank you both. The screen is yours. Thank you so much. And um, I'm very happy to be here with you, Keith, talking about the book, which I think is so um, beautiful and, and strong and really interesting. Um, I think you wanted to get started by doing a, a short reading. Do you want to go ahead and do that now? And then I have some questions for you and then we can open up to the um, audience and see who else has a question for you. Great. Um, and thank you so much for doing this, Megan. Um, for those who have not read Megan's work, I really recommend it. Um, women's work was one of the books that I read while writing this book and it, it um, it really was an inspiration um, in a lot of ways. It's a great book. Uh, and, and I'm very happy to be at Politics and Prose, not my hometown bookstore, but the hometown bookstore of um, my wife, Emily, um, who was mentioned in the intro. Um, so next time in person, I hope. Um, but uh, so yes, so I'm gonna read uh, the first part of an essay called uh, Love and Anger. The book is divided into, um, nine chapter essays. They're, they're all about the same group of people, <laughs> um, uh, myself uh, uh, mostly, and, and, and uh, our, our older son, Rafi, as he kind of gets older, but they're, they're sort of thematically organized. So this one is about um, getting angry uh, and, and what that feels like and, and how I uh, tried to deal with it. So uh, love and anger. When your baby is born, you think you are a certain kind of person and are going to be a certain kind of parent. It's all a fantasy. You don't know anything about yourself until your baby gets older. You don't know anything about yourself until the day your adorable little boy looks you in the eye, notices that your face is right up close to him and punches you in the nose. The first two years were physical, breast milk and poop and Raffi's delicate little head that could so easily bump into something. Lack of sleep, of course. Worries that he would choke on something but we survived. He hit his head a few times, but not too badly. One time he put a giant dead cockroach in his mouth, but I pulled it out and flushed it down the toilet. One of Rafi's favorite stories, by the way, about his, uh, about his uh, infancy is, is about how he ate a giant cockroach. Whenever he sees a cockroach, he says, I once ate a cockroach. Um, and then he was two, he was running around and wearing a little hat. And now we had to prevent him from getting hit by a car. 
He was a loud and rambunctious boy. He liked jumping up and down in his crib or on our bed or on one of us if we made the mistake of lying down. One time my father was visiting. One time my father was visiting and Rafi wanted to show off. So for half an hour, he ran in rapid circles around our small living room yelling, I am fire tuck, I am fire tuck. He got kicked out of daycare for refusing to nap and jumping up and down on his cot, causing the other, old, causing the other children also not to nap. Someone around this time told us that the hard part was just beginning. We couldn't believe it. Harder than no sleep? Harder than waking up every 10 minutes to Google an imaginary symptom? Yes. Rafi had never been placid or well-behaved, but this was different. He now seemed to know what he was doing when he disobeyed us, and this made it so much worse. The advice books called it testing boundaries. That didn't really capture the experience. Testing boundaries was your coworker sending emails on the weekend. This was your coworker when you picked him up starting to scratch you. You turned him around so that he couldn't do that, and he reared his head back and headbutted you. He'd start swinging his little feet and sometimes catch you in the balls. There was frustration involved, but also actual physical pain. He'd throw his milk bottle at you and it would hit, and it would hit you in the head. Sometimes we tried to reason with him. Other times we gave him a timeout, putting him in his room and locking the door for a few minutes. But he would come back out and just do whatever had gotten him in trouble again a few minutes later. Then he would get another timeout. He noticed the timeouts and didn't, and didn't like them, but they didn't seem to affect his behavior very much. I found the episodes of hitting and scratching very upsetting. There was the pain, that was part of it. But there was also the feeling of betrayal. Our little baby boy whom we had fed and clothed and cuddled, was this how he repaid us? Something else as well, fear. Was this our kid? Was this what he was like? Had we done something wrong as parents that was causing this? Was it too late to correct course? All these thoughts and fears mixed together in moments of conflict and came forth for me as outrage. One time when Emily was already quite pregnant with, with Raffi's little brother, we had a conflict over dinner. Raffi didn't want to eat his. He demanded a totally different dinner. Emily was inclined to let him have it. I disagreed. We had already run the bath for one thing and for another, it was a perfectly fine dinner. After some back and forth, Raffi picked up my glass of water and doused me with it. What the fuck? I tore off my wet shirt, picked up Rafi, stripped him of his clothes and jammed him into the warm bath. He was terrified and bawling. I felt out of control. Emily was scared. She went into the bathroom to, com to comfort Rafi while I stewed in the living room and gradually started to feel remorseful. Eventually, I went to apologize. Emily urged Rafi to accept my apology. Rafi was reluctant. That is not, that is not nice said Rafi. And it was true. It was turning out that data was not nice. I'll, uh, I'll stop there. So um, that's a really good, I'm glad that you started with that section because I think it really gives people an important idea if they haven't read the book yet, which is how um, how open you are in this book with some really difficult aspects of becoming a parent. It I think um, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it is definitely a very vulnerable book and it is a very honest book. I don't know how many parents would be comfortable, um, you know, writing about the experience of hitting their children when they don't in fact want to be spanking their children or, you know, becoming physical and that sensation of anger that can happen as a parent with a young child. Um, I, you know, I, I think, I think it's that is why this book is so interesting, because from the emotional honesty of it to the sort of social and some of the political aspects of becoming a parent and schools in New York City and uh, Black Lives Matter protests, you, you really kind of weave all these different aspects together in a way that I think is really interesting and very vulnerable um, and courageous. I think it takes a lot of courage to write like this um, about some of these things. So uh, that is why I, I, what I really want to ask you is um, just to tell us a little bit about the process of deciding to write this book. Like, at what point did you think, I'm actually going to turn this experience of going from, you know, being a, a, a writer and kind of a literary figure uh, to being a father who's sort of vulnerable in all these new ways and trying to figure out this new role, 
I'm actually going to turn that into a piece of writing. I'm going to, I'm going to write a book. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it, it should be said, I, so, so one thing, I, you know, um, that, that essay is, is, is a very intense essay. Um, definitely. I, I have manhandled Rafi more than I would, would have wanted to, uh, hitting, I, I, I have not, you know, I, I slapped him on the wrist one, one time. Right. Um, but, but sorry, just, I didn't mean to, to I, yeah. Keith Gasson <laughs> is not abusing his child. There is an incident of slapping where yes. uh, I think Rafi yes. says to you, you hit me and you say yes. to him yes. and you say, yes, I did. I hit him, but it was that, it yeah. was that wrist slap, but yeah. even that much, I mean, that's really hard to put out in a public record and put it into mm -hmm. the world. So, you um, know. yeah, no, uh, yeah. Uh, totally. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it started, you know, it started, um, you know, when Rafi was born, as I, as I talk about in the book, I, I, I really felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I was very nervous and scared. Um, and I happened to be married to Emily, who, who did know what she was doing. Um, and really, for the first year, two years, it was like Emily time. I mean, that was, you know, and, and just, she was, she just, she knew why Rafi was crying and she, she literally kept him alive, uh, with, with her body. Right. She was, you know, every, his, all his food was coming from her. Um, it, so it, it definitely didn't occur to me at, at that time, uh, to write anything. Um, but I did, I was conscious of the fact that I was going through a very profound experience. Um, and that, you know, that I just, I, um, I was middle-aged, I had, but I, I never had a kid, uh, the kind of intensity of my emotions, um, you know, mostly just like fear that something would happen to him, right? I, I, I really, you know, uh, one of the kind of questions at the beginning of the book is like, I, I, I ask, you know, what's the big deal about having kids? Why are people so freaked out, right? Like, why can't they get anything done, you know? And, and the answer is because you, you have this tiny creature who might die. And, and that, I mean, that's the answer, right? And you're just worried about them dying. Um, and it's not, and, you know, you can tell yourself all you want that, oh, well, you know, billions of people <laughs> have been born and, and, and not died, but, you know, but some do actually die, right? So, um, so I was conscious of going through this, this very intense experience, uh, kind of alongside Emily. And then as Rafi was approaching three, um, you know, the, the first thing I wrote was about teaching him Russian. So I had, I had uh, you know, from when he was very little, I started talking Russian to him. I, I grew up speaking Russian. I was born in Russia. Um, Russia has been very important to me. And at some point, kind of like without even giving it a ton of thought, I, I was just like, okay, I'm going to speak Russian to him. That's what my parents spoke to me. I feel comfortable doing that with him. Um, and I just started speaking exclusively Russian to him. Um, and at around three is when he just it's just started being really interesting um he would he kind of he noticed that i was speaking a different language uh than his mother sometimes he didn't like it uh and he would say you know he said this amazing thing dada we need to put english into you uh <laughs> like it's in mom it's in me and i you yeah. know and i said well, uh i have russian in me well, you know what about you and he said and i said why don't you speak to me in russian because he would i would speak in russian he would answer in english and he'd said, no, mama put English in me. Like, it's impossible. I can't speak Russian. So, <laughs> so I was having this experience of, of this kind of Russian experience. Then I started kind of like reading about it. Um, I found this amazing um, kind of ling me uh, linguist's memoir from the 1940s, yeah. um, which was about a, a German linguist who lived living in the United States, um, married to an American woman and, and trying to teach his daughter uh, German. Um, and that was so interesting. So it just kind of like, the way my mind works, I was like, okay, this is like an essay because there's this personal experience that I'm having, which is quite intense. And, and also my kind of very mixed feelings about, um, you know, I, I wished I was teaching him Spanish or Italian. I had very mixed feelings about actually Russian and Russian history. And, and I teach him Russian. And then what happens? He goes to Russia, you know, do I want that? <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, you know, this was, this was a few years ago, but, you know, even more so now, right? But like, even a few years ago, it wasn't a place that you necessarily wanted to go for summer vacation. Um, and, you know, and I was like, oh, uh, is, you know, do I really want to be doing this? And so I found, I found all those questions interesting. And, and so that was the first one I wrote. And, and um, I was kind of, it was around the publication of uh, A Terrible Country. So it was kind of like part of the promotion for that book. So I didn't really think I would do more of them. Um, then actually, as I was, as I was, uh, I was thinking about this today, as I was, um, you know, doing events for a terrible country, I, um, which is about Russia, 
I found myself, I was like, okay, like I like talking about Russia, but what I really want to talk about is my three-year-old. <laughs> He's so interesting. Right. And like all this stuff I'm going through as a parent. And I just, I just, I just very conscious. And like once in a while, people would be like, oh, what are you doing these days? Um, and it would be this like opening for me to talk about um, you know, fatherhood and, and Rafi and his antics. And he was so interesting. And, and, um, and I really enjoyed that. So I was like, Oh, right. I find this so interesting. And so, so I wrote that Russian thing. And then, um, the next one was about schools. Um, we, we, you know, it was, it was, he was three and a half. It was time to go find him a pre-K and that experience was not what I expected. Um, it kind of dredged up a lot of, I mean, it was interesting kind of politically. And then, um, you know, my own parents who had, who had, brought us from the Soviet Union. So we didn't have to go to Soviet schools. So there was this kind of tradition in the family of, of you know, optimizing your school situation um, and being willing to, you know, travel halfway across the world for it. Uh, so I, I thought that was interesting. So, um, and I mean, all, all of it was like stuff that I had seen written, certainly people have written about schools and, and segregated schools and have done, you know, much, more thorough job uh, than I have. Nicole Anna Jones is the person that I cite um, um, in the piece and who I had actually met around this time. Um, but, uh, you know, I hadn't quite seen it from this perspective and it was something, it was like this thing that I wanted, perpetually wanted to talk to people about. Um, and, you know, when you're in that mode as a writer and you just find yourself talking about a particular thing over and over again, um, you know, that's, that does sometimes mean that you need to go and, and write it. Um, and so it's just, it's just kind of one thing after another that I encountered. Um, and then the, the, the third essay was the, was the one that I just read from, which was about um, definitely the most difficult to write. Um, and it really was something I had not seen described. Um, uh, but by, you know, um, and I'm sure that's because I haven't, you know, read everything and I'm sure there's something where it is described, but I, I had not seen someone, um, a man talking about, you know, their intense relationship with their toddler and how they have trouble controlling their anger. Um, and yeah. it really did feel like it, you know, when, when that was published on the New Yorker, uh, website, I, I really, I was like, okay, I'm putting things in public yeah. that are yeah like that will cause people to think less of me you know and um and I did I got I mean I got a lot of emails that were very supportive but others were like you need to do this psychological program and oh, here's this psychologist you can talk to um and they were well-meaning and uh, I mean, one, one of the things you find out when you start writing about um like parenting is that uh you know every doctor has written uh, or many doctors have written, <laughs> uh, you know, a book where, and, and they read your stuff and they're like, ah, my book will solve this particular problem. Yes. And you're like, <laughs> you're like well. <laughs> but you do put a good number of, you know, you weave a lot of those books through this book. It's funny because it's, it, the book is in part uh, a dialogue with the sort of the inevitable voices that a parent encounters um, about these different things. So that is there. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I was reading those. Somebody asked me the other day whether I was kind of like doing it as like research, and I and I was like, no, I was reading the stuff because I, I mean, <laughs> certainly the 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 discipline stuff. You know, I was reading it because I was desperate for advice. Right. Uh, and I would, you know, each book I would read, I would be like, I'm going to go do do exactly what this book says. <laughs> Uh, I know that's, yeah, that's kind of like a funny that. aspect of your character in this book like you like there's three characters and you're definitely one of them um <laughs> is your kind of like rigorous attempts to apply the scientific method that you've gotten from the last book that you've read and like it's sort of becomes you kind of turn yourself into a little bit of a comic character in that sense of this like you know you're there's always kind of like Emily is sort of in the wings saying sensible things and not freaking out about things. And you're like a mad scientist with your latest parenting book, kind of like mm -hmm. shuttling around trying to apply this stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I was, I was looking for help, you know, and I really did yeah. think, yeah. Um, I mean, amazing. I was thinking, I was like, what, what, what parent, you know, what like advice book helped me the most. I have to admit um, one, two, three magic. 
Do you know this I book? didn't read that one. I don't know that one. <laughs> and in, I think after, maybe after your you know difficult days, where it came out more recently, but it's an entire book. Like, you know, it's like a 300 page book about counting to three. Oh no. And, <laughs> but it's, it, it works. I mean, it really, like I started doing it and, and it, you just, you start counting and it just creates this like drama and yeah. And like Rafi, just like he'll put on his shoes or it's not great. Like you can't be like, if he's like hitting his brother, you don't really have time to count to three <laughs> or you can count to three really fast, but it, you know, and he's not really in them, but sometimes, sometimes if he's doing something you, you don't like, you, you can count to three. It's, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's whole, true. Actually, I, ver I can three. verify this. I also count to three. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't get it from a book, but I just yeah. started doing it. I think because it was done to me and it's very effective. And my kids are still hardwired that if it's like one, two, they're, they suddenly start like scrambling. They're like, what do yes. I have to do? It's yes. actually a little bit disturbing in its power to kind of like, pull them up but anyway it's a, yeah well I, I so, did actually read a whole book about it so you decided to go <laughs> ahead and do this so it's interesting so I'm, I guess what I'm hearing you say is that in some ways the, the difficult perhaps part of the book came out before the book in an essay that people had read so you kind of went through like it's not like the book is publishing and all of this is being seen in public for the first time like you've gone through sort of some of that already is behind you so that's kind so of interesting yeah, and 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 you would think it would be inoculate me against mm -hmm. these emails that I've already started to receive about oh. you know my psychological issues that yeah. um, people like to diagnose from afar. But um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, some of it like I don't know. Um, there's there's some of it obviously is, is new, and I and I kind of like wove it together in a way that it hadn't been. So now you can kind of read it all the way through. I hope more or yeah. less. No, it's very, it's a code coherent narrative. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things I was wondering about when I thought about you deciding to write this book is that, and I'm sure that I am not the only person who has this thought or this question, which is that as somebody who knows you a bit and knows Emily a bit and knows your respective work, I think that many of us would have expected Emily to be the one to have written this book. Um, and I think it's really interesting the fact that you are balancing these two writing careers and in some ways you have a shared pool of material to to look at and I wonder if there was any discussion about that you know about who you're like I would like to write this book well what if I also want to write a book about that I mean was there anything like that between the two of you um uh, I, I mean yeah I mean I only started writing about uh you know motherhood uh yeah before I started writing about fatherhood, right? I mean, she, mm -hmm. and I, I love the things she did. I really just yeah. think they're so great. And, and, and they really kind of fix these moments in time and in a, in a way that I, I find really memorable and, and I appreciate them a lot. Um, she also runs my, my favorite Instagram account, <laughs> which is the, <laughs> you know, kind of photos of our family with Rye commentary. Um, and, um, yeah, no, and I, I mean, basically, like, I, uh, I did write, you know, one or two of these and, and, but, but Emily had written much more and I, and actually a friend of mine suggested, you know, he's like, Emily should really do a kind of like, this, you know, a book, uh, her stuff is so good. And I, and I, I read and I kind of relate that to her, but she was writing, she was writing perfect tunes. I mean, she was right. writing another book. Right. Um, yeah. Which which is very much informed by her experience of motherhood. Right. It, it is about a relationship between a mother and a daughter. Um, yeah, she was writing another book, and 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 she did encourage me to 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 write this book. Um, That's great. So she yeah. does have. Um, she did have that funny the line that I I really found this hilarious, and I'm sure. I bet you know what I'm going to say. The Christopher Columbus of mommy blogging, which she recently That's said to an interviewer yes, from yes, New York yes, magazine. Yes. yes. Um, um, I was messaging her actually, when I saw that. I was like, I'm I'm laughing so hard. It was such such a great line, and you yeah. know, I uh, I actually she Emily, you know, she, uh, these things, these like uh, hilarious um, sort of lines, you know, <laughs> they just kind of flow out of her. <laughs> so um, she's not the one. I'm the one who said that to the journalist. And, oh, you um, said that. I just, well, just, you know, oh. I, mean, I said a lot of other things, but I was like, I was like, you know, do you know that she once called me the Christopher Columbus of my oh. And, and um, uh, the journalist Liz Wilde, was, she was very funny. She's like, you have a dangerously funny wife. 
Um, it's true. Um, but yeah, no. I yes, mean, she and, does get she gets a lot of the best lines, even in the book. I would say that's true. She's very funny. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, no. And um, am I the uh, is the question? Am I the Christopher Columbus of? Yeah. Do you? Um, I mean, do you think? Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a serious undertone to that to that uh-huh. funny description, yes. um, which I'm I'm sure you thought through and. What what do you think? I mean, is that is there any fairness in saying that? I, I totally. I mean, I, you know, like, I guess my position. Yes. I mean, like, I mean, the yeah. one of the really uh, kind of striking things in doing, you know, a lot of the reading around this was, you know, when I kind of like got a little like, when I, you know, when, when Rafi was three, I was just like reading one, two, three magic. Right. Like I, I was just like reading <laughs> to something. About, but at a certain point, I kind of like um, started reading some of the more like memoristic stuff. And um, the just the, like the volume and quality of the work written by women, by the way, very much including women's work, which I love. Oh, thank you. Know? you. I mean, really, thank no, you. but I, I mean, that, um, uh, is just like amazing. It's just so vastly superior, right, to the dad literature. I mean, there, you know, the dad right. literature is very thin. There's not that much dad literature. That's There's not true. that much of it. Yeah. And that that which exists that I read was not very good. And um, and it's like embarrassed by it's 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 like has this kind of like, oh, I'm I'm sorry that I'm a dad, you know, and yeah. like I'm so I'm such a bad <laughs> dad. I mean, and like I obviously do some of that myself, like which because it's true. But um I mean, one of the things that, and I say this in the introduction, like it just that kind of like bad dad, like su- stupid dad. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's some once in a while you get like super dad. Right. And I was like, right. God, I don't know any, like, I don't know any dads like that. Like the dads I know actually um, are, are take it very seriously, right. like do a fair amount, typically not as much as their wives, but they do, you know, they, mm-hmm. they, they, they do a fair amount. They, and like, they want to do, they want to be good at it. Like they want to, you know, do a good job, right? And yeah. um, I hadn't seen that. I hadn't seen that in in a like in a book like this. Like you, you see it once in a while in a novel, but um, so I, yeah, I, I felt like there was something for like from the from, from the dad's perspective. For perspective. sure. Um, well, I think it's very important. I mean, I I I am very happy to see men writing about parenthood because I think it should be. Uh, you know, it should be for all the parents to be writing about it and to be yeah. thinking about it. And it's sort of, you know, it's obviously problematic that it's just like a women's issue, um, you know, that it's kind of has been relegated in that way um, to something that doesn't concern everybody when clearly it does. So I think it's yeah. great. Um, I and, guess. And, I mean, it should be. Oh, just I mean, just to yeah. add to that, like, I think like I, mean, I, I say this in the, in the beginning, like, my, you know, I, I'm, I had this funny conversation with my dad. Or I was, yeah. where I had, I had interviewed my second grade teacher, um, who I still remember. I'm still in touch with. She was really fantastic. And I said, "Do you remember Ms. Lynch?" And he says, "Who?" And I said, "My second grade teacher." He says, "No." And I said, "Well, <laughs> you, surely you met her at a parent teacher conference." And my dad just found this hilarious. You know, he just he he just laughed. He said, "I was at work," um, yeah. and like you know, I like all like all the dads I know are, are very. Um, you know, they know the names of their teacher, the kids' right. teachers, and like yeah. they go to the parent-teacher conferences. They do a lot of the um, kind of interfacing with the, with the teachers, the drop-offs, the pickoffs. Um, and so, I, it did strike me then as like a very much a generational thing, right? Where we're this new, you know, maybe a transitional generation toward total equality, right? But but very um, optimistic. I like this optimism. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, but it is a kind of new ex- newish experience, right? For yeah. a lot of dads to be like as involved um yeah. as 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 they are as we are. So that too s- struck me as a kind of justification. Totally. Um and I guess the third the only other I, the other character that we haven't spoken about of course is Rafi himself. Um, who is such a strong presence. And it is, it's, I feel like this book is so interesting because it really does braid different genres together. But on one level, it really is almost a love letter to your son. And it's a really beautiful and kind of elaborately wrought kind of portrayal of, of his first years and his character and the things he said. I mean, this is like the ultimate scrapbook of baby memories. Um, <laughs> Do you ever though, I mean, how do you think he will see himself portrayed in the book as he becomes an adult? How do you imagine in the future? 
as he starts to grow up, of course, eventually he'll want to read the book and he'll read it at different ages. And, you know, it's, it's, it'll be a part of his life and his experience as well. What do you think his relationship with this book and with the depiction of himself in the book will be like? Um, and it's something that as like, as the book became more and more of a reality was something I worried about more and more. Um, and there are things, um, you know, I mean, actually the thing that I worry, you know, the things that get you are always not actually the things that you're worried about. <laughs> um, I've learned that much about, right. You know, like you're like, you write a, you publish an article and you're like very worried about X and then everybody gets mad about Y and you hadn't even so occurred to you. Yeah. They would get mad about Y. But um, in this case, there's this essay, the essay about sports mm-hmm. where I talk about how he doesn't really have an aptitude for sports. And, and um, I feel like that one, uh, and I've had friends say to me, like, you know, what happens when he's like in high school? And um, yeah, I mean, that one, that one's going to require some explaining from, from old data. Um, you know, I, I like uh, more broadly, I do feel um, my hope is that like th- th- these sorts of things, and I've, I'm actually writing an article about this. I'm writing an article about um, kids who have been written about by their parents. Oh, wow. Um, who are now adults. And just to oh kind of inter- inter- interviewing them about their experiences, and and it's very mixed, and right. um, and, it, it, and you know, and, and all, like there's not there's not like a huge data set, like this isn't like millions of people, right? Um, yeah. Although it's although like w- one thing that's interesting is that it's going to become millions of people as like everybody who's been on featured on Instagram and on Facebook as a, yeah. as a kid is grows up, right? So then it becomes a mass phenomenon. But for the moment, it's still just you know I don't know a dozen books or whatever two dozen um I, I guess i feel like that the the book is part of the totality of the relationship mm-hmm. right and it's i don't think it's ever going to be um the biggest part i mean i hope <laughs> right i, I right. hope there's many other things in our relationship right and the book is one of them but but um you know and and that uh, that we will have I, I hope a good relationship right and um you know, and, and that I will explain, you know, that I, that's what I do, right? Um, I, I write stuff down. Um, and, you know, and, you know, and, and kind of a little bit more optimistically, like my dad, my dad's favorite stories about me are about how I was a little hooligan, you know, like all his stories are about how I used to get in fights and like, I would come home crying because I tried to fight one guy, but then this other guy started fighting me, you know, like the, the, and my dad just finds those stories so hilarious and I've never found them to be, um, you know, limiting or, or like insulting or, you know, that just happens to be what my dad thinks is funny. And like, I respect that. Right. Yeah. Um, That's so interesting. Um, I mean, you must, so when was this actually written? Like, when did you complete your draft? It must've been at least a year, right. Or months. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was last summer. So do you even now already look at it and think things have changed so much since then? They have I changed mean, so much. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you get a little taste of it. Like, you know, it's called the first five years and it's like maybe a little bit more than it's like five and a half years. But, but then at the end, he's like, I did a little epilogue that I wrote, I guess this winter where uh, it's called Rafi at six. Right. And it's, you know, it's, you, he, he does change so much. Right. And, and then he kind of reemerges as himself underneath <laughs> that. Um, but right now we're in this period of him, um, he's learned to read. He just learned to read like two months ago after, after you know, they, they started them in kindergarten. And like, it was like for, for about a year, we were like, he's about to learn to read any minute, any minute. Um, and then actually, <laughs> and then actually Emily ingeniously for Hanukkah got him a, a Switch, a Nintendo Switch. Um, little like video game. Right, I know. I'm help. familiar. Yes, I, oh, I'm I very was, unfortunately familiar with the Nintendo oh, Switch. Okay, yeah. I was so opposed to this. I was so upset. I was like, "This is the last thing we need in our lives." Um, but it was like too late, and we had already ordered it. And um, and then Rafi started playing a game called Animal Crossing, which is like a role, some kind of game where you kind of walk around yeah. the village and gather stuff and barter things. But it involves all this reading. Um, so basically like the, 
a very strict New York City kindergarten curriculum um, where he learned phonics and then Animal Crossing. Uh, taught him how to read. Yeah. <laughs> and, then it will be and, Minecraft and then he'll be killing people on Fortnite. It's great. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just kidding. I don't I'm, know I'm, but, I'm, but, sorry, I'm kidding, not kidding, but anyway. But, but, yes. but now, yeah, when he's not on his iPad playing Minecraft, he just sits and reads. He right. just he will just sit yeah. there and read. And it's it's just, and I'm like, and then I have this book about how he was, you know, such a troublemaker. And he's this angel who sits there and reads all day. Um, it is a little confusing, <laughs> but I'm I think he's he's still in there. Right. I mean, we only have a few minutes. I'm going to, I have three minutes yeah. before I'm planning to open to the audience for a Q&A. So I don't, I have so many more questions we haven't talked to. So let me just choose. I mean, one of the things that I thought was really um, interesting in the book is how you, you mentioned it briefly in the beginning, the, the issue of Russian and the Russian language. Um, I, I love the way that you wrote about it. I, you, there, you talked about, um, you know, the endearments and the range of endearments that are available in Russian. Um, but it also kind of operates as a sort of, it ends up bringing in a lot of darkness. It's almost like a kind of a camouflaging of the sort of difficult history of Russia and the difficult history of your family having to leave Russia. Um, and you're sort of, you're kind of looking at all of these different things that are coming into Rafi through the language. And you also write about something I've thought about a lot, which is how you're able to have different, how one is able to have different personalities and different languages, um, which is certainly true. I, I'm curious with all of the things that you wrote about Russian and how Russia kind of weaves through this book, how is Rafi's Russian now? And have you had further thoughts on, you know, having taught him Russian and brought Russian to him in that way as you watched him grow up a little bit more? Um, you know, I mean, the, the interesting thing that's changed, so his Russian, it, it's still, um, I speak to him in Russian and he answers in English. Um, his comprehension of what I say is, I don't know, 90%. Like, I mean, some, there's, there's occasionally, he doesn't understand, he asks me what I, what, about a word, but he understands the vast majority of what I say. Um, he doesn't do it. He right. <laughs> Do what I say, but like he understands. Right. Um, Another issue. And yeah. Um, and he himself, like, you know, a year, about exactly a year ago, he came up to me in the playground and he said, he whispered, he said, you know, he said, come here. And he like had me lean over and he said, I've always wondered what it would be like to have a data who speaks English. Wow. And I was just like, I was so sad. And I was like, what terrible. have I done? Yeah, like I haven't even like genuinely taught him Russian, but I've like made him alienated from his peers because he has this weird dad mm. who's always yelling in Russian. And um, <laughs> that was so sad. And then, but then we were actually just visiting my dad um, last weekend and um, everybody there was speaking Russian. And by the end of it, Rafi's like, you know, I'm just gonna sprinkle, you know, he didn't use the word sprinkle, but he, he meant, I'm gonna sprinkle some Russian words when I speak English. I'm just gonna throw in a Russian word once in a while. Wow. Um, and, and then he's like, Ilya, I'm gonna speak Russian to you. Let's do, let's start speaking Russian. Like, so he didn't actually, um, he actually can't, like he, at, at this point, like he doesn't have an active vocabulary. He has a passive vocabulary, but um, yeah, totally different attitude toward it. Um, just from like a weekend with my dad. And I mean, the, the joke, like the, the sort of darkly hilarious thing in the, as I mentioned in the Russia um, language essay is that this German linguist, right, had all these struggles teaching his daughter German. And then they go to Germany, Nazi Germany in 1935. And they're there for summer. And by the end of it, she's speaking great German, but it's Nazi Germany, so they leave, you know? Um, but I'm like, oh, you know, and the joke that I have in the book is like, Oh, if he can go to Nazi Germany, surely I can go to Putin's Russia. But that, like, I wrote that line a few years ago, and yeah. we were going to go this summer, and we're not going to go this summer. Um, yeah. So that brings me. I actually am going to open up to Q and A. So if anyone has a question, please send it. I've already gotten some questions, not only through the Q and A um, part of the Zoom call, but also from some friends who are watching and who are sending me text messages of questions for you. Wow. So, okay. and one of them That's segues lovely. very well. So I'm going to go ahead with that one. Um, Somebody is asking, has, has your own childhood in the Soviet Union influenced or impacted your parenting style consciously or subconsciously? 
I think it's an interesting oh. question. Well, there's a whole essay called Bear Dad, <laughs> which is <laughs> it's kind of the concluding essay. That's that, by the way, again, Emily, that's an Emily um, co coinage, Bear Dad. Um, what? I read Bear Dad. Okay. Oh, Emily yeah. coinage, coinage. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I was reading, I read um, the, the Tiger Mom book, which I thought was, uh, you know, really well done. Um, and I was like, Tiger Mom, she, you know, Chinese, she's Chinese, what, you know, and who am I? And Emily's like, you're Bear Dad, uh, Russian Dad. Right. right. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, kind of the whole book is, is kind of about that. And like, it's, a, you know, like, it's this like, okay. Yeah, that's true. The, 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 the the one thing that I've learned about parenting is you read all these books that are like, here's how to be a perfect parent. And by the way, they all have contradictory ways of being a perfect parent, right? So that's in itself uh, a bit dubious. <laughs> but I, I believe that if you really like follow any of these books all the way, you, you'll be, you'll do a pretty good job. Um, but what you run up against is like your own personality, right? And you know, like, so the most appealing ones are the ones where you like, listen to the kid and, you know, and you're like, oh, you're feeling frustrated, you know, you don't want, you don't want to leave the playground, like, you know, um, you don't want to put on your pants. And um, I find that very appealing uh, when I read about it in a, in a, in a book, like how to talk to your kids so they will listen. Um, but I just can't do it. And by the, at the end of the, at the end of the book and in, in, in this essay, Bear Dad, I read all these um, books about how they parent better in other countries. I start thinking about Russia. Do they parent better in Russia? Clearly, no. The answer is no. Um, and yet, there are things about. I mean, I had a very happy childhood with my right. Russian Jewish parents. I, um, and they weren't mean. And but my dad was pretty strict, and he yelled at me, you know. And um, so, and then I finally, I, I um, I read this amazing book by a, a developmental psychologist slash uh, slash anthropology kind of works in an anthropological method named Jonathan Tudge who did this massive study of different three-year-olds in different countries and and basically you know he comes to this conclusion that like people parent differently in different places based on like the kind of the culture the history of that place the needs of each family in each particular circumstance and there's just no way for you to become like a French parent, <laughs> you know, while you're living in the United States. It's just not yeah. a thing. And that, I mean, that book was very, uh, that uh, Bringing Up Baby, a book about how to be a French parent was very effective at, you know, arousing great jealousy and angst. Right. Um, but you can't actually do it because we don't have the resources. We don't have the, uh, you know, support structure, et cetera. Um, and similarly, like, you're just kind of, you, you're going to parent more or less the way that you were parented, right? And um, you can improve on that. Like you can definitely improve on it if you were parented very badly. In my case, <laughs> I, I felt like I was parented pretty well. So right. I kind of don't even want to improve on it that much, you know, uh, anyway. So yeah, so at, yeah, at the end, I, I kind of um, I come to a certain piece <laughs> around like my limitations as a parent, you know, and um that was helpful to me just to be like, you know, you like are this Russian person or part of you is and like, you are a bit of a yeller and like, and, and you do kind of believe that homework should get done, you know, and that's like, that's okay. That's an okay way to be. And, and I'm married to someone who believes different things. And, you know, that like, and Rafi will be, you know, our kids will be exposed to both those things. And, you know, as long as we don't like, kill each other in the process. Yeah. Be okay. Yeah. That's a good, I mean, it's good to set the bar high for yourself. <laughs> Just don't kill each other. It'll be fine. Um, yeah. We have these great questions people are sending in. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to choose a couple of them. Uh, is parental, this is This is interesting. Is parental anger normal? Is it possibly useful or is it inevitably authoritarian and destructive? Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, a question for someone like more qualified, and then I. In your opinion, but yeah. In my opinion, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is kind of uh, what I was trying to articulate in the last question. Like, uh, obviously, if it if it like it bleeds over in you know if it crosses over into abuse, right? Or it's it's um, 
just constant anger, right? Um, but like if, you know, um, this, and by the way, this has gotten a lot better <laughs> in the last few months, but like when Rafi hits his little brother, right? Like I'm gonna get mad at him. And, and that's, uh, I don't see, I don't think that's authoritarian to be like, don't hit your little brother, you know, and make him cry um, before dinner. Um, and, and, you know, there are these, uh, there's some parenting guru who says you have to be a, like a CEO, you have to be a calm, you know, um, CEO yeah. of the family who, you know, dispenses ice cold, you know, directives. And like, I'm sure if that works for you, that's great. But um, and this is something Emily said to me at one point, like, it's okay for your kids to see that you're human. You know, and yeah. I think I think that's really wise. <laughs> I mean, I've thought about this. Um, I personally, I, I think there's also an argument to be made for that, that that's part of how you learn a boundary is that you see that actually your behavior can eventually elicit a reaction that you don't like and that might even be a little bit scary or it might really kind of upset you. And that's not always a bad, I think that some kids actually will require that lesson before mm. they sort of start to regulate themselves a bit, unfortunately, I think. Yeah. I, that's, yeah. I don't know, that's just my opinion. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so I mean, the, the behaviorists would say, well, no, you're like reinforcing it, right? Of course, yeah, that's the yeah. other side of the argument, but I mean, I don't know. Anyway, the mysteries of trying to <laughs> raise small human beings. It, um, but it, it really does depend on the kid, right? I mean, it depends yeah, on the parent. That's like another what you're thing. Capable yeah. of and what you're like, uh, but also yep. the kid. And and I mean, and and I, I, boy, I did not know how different two kids could be until we had Rafi's brother. You know? So are you going to write one about Ilya as well? <laughs> no, I, I know everybody I mean, must. Are, or is that is that Emily's book? Can Emily write about Ilya? Emily's Emily's. Book. Okay. Emily can do do a book on Rafi. I, you know, I don't think it's. Uh, he, you know, I mean, she had a very dis different experience of this whole, you know, all these years. Um, oh my gosh, I've just realized there's yet more questions <laughs> in the chat. Okay, um, uh, somebody wants you to, this is a big question, um, but I'm, they, they're curious about the school selection. They want to know what parents should pay less attention in your opinion to, and what areas do you think get overlooked? You actually write about this at some length um, of your sort of thought process of working through these questions. There's a chapter about this in the book, but do you want to say a couple words to just give the highlight of your answer? Oh, hey guys. Oh. Um, I'm still doing this thing. Are you hungry? <laughs> no. no, okay. I don't know. You're hungry? I'm okay. Are we going to have a guest appearance of the title? <laughs> do, you to, do you want to say hi? Title character. No, okay. Okay. No, he's shy. Hi, hi, but Ilya's not shy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, as schools, I mean, I, I just feel like uh, my mistake and was was actually thinking about schools too much, and really just you know and thinking I was going to figure it all out. You know, with even though I had very limited information, and mm -hmm. and we lo we love our school, we're very happy there. But if I did, if I had to do it all over again, you don't love your school. Um, I would um, just go to the school that was closest to us. Right, right. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a good section. That, that I like that chapter about schools. Um, someone is asking if you're planning to write a new Rafi book every five years. <laughs> um, it, is, it is called the first five years, but I was just trying to just to indicate to readers that that's what <laughs> that's the you know it's it's the early childhood. It's not like a memoir of a teenager. Or a, um, I have no I have no plans to do another one. So um, I saw somebody asking about grandparents. Yeah, this is a really have, interesting question. Do you can you see it? I, um, I just saw somebody saying you should talk about grandparents, and I happen to know that Rafi's uh, grandparents. Um, are on this, I think, are, are watching the Zoom. So um, Kate and Rob, we are very grateful <laughs> to you. And we could not have um, done this whole thing without you. And thank you. Um, they, no, they, they really are amazing grandparents. Um, well, did you read I what they said? They lived closer. She, oh, no. The, <laughs> the, the woman who wrote, I think, it's a, I think it's a grandmother. She said, yes, uh -huh. she says, my husband and I spend so much energy feeling timid with our grandsons based on how we see our own children parenting. It's so hard and confusing. I feel like this is a little bit of a new dynamic with our generation of parents. I think 
our, you know, as a group, we've been very quick to kind of criticize, you know, the way that our parents are, you know, behave around our children, like they have the wrong methods, and they don't, they haven't read all those books, and they don't understand (laughs) that they shouldn't be doing those things. And I feel like that there was less of that before, or maybe that the sort of parents were not so emboldened to criticize their own parents. And so I, I see this a lot. And sometimes it kind of seems a little bit sad to me. But anyway, what are your what are your thoughts about that? So should should grandparents be be uh, well? Um, she's saying that you know she give her some advice. She says, Can, "How would you wrap grandparents into your picture?" That she that she feels timid with her own mm. grandchildren because mm. she doesn't. I think she doesn't quite relate to the way that they're being raised. So she's mm. afraid she's going to do the wrong thing and upset people. Mm. That's what I'm reading from this. Um, I mean, I get my position is not <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's okay. I should pick up, okay. Okay, okay. Is that Where's Rafi? That's Ilya. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Rafi's, you know, he, he can take care of himself. Famous Rafi. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, my position, and, you know, I, I can't speak for the questioner's uh, kids <laughs> or, or, you know, um, her, her, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I just kind of feel like when you're at grandma's house, you you play by grandma's rules, you know, and, and yeah. when we go up to my dad's house, you know, that's a different situation, very different, and they get to be exposed to, you know, different, um, you know, styles of eating and, uh, you know, kind of uh, just relating to one another, and, you know, whether you eat uh, on time or not on time at my dad's house, you know, um, I, I so to me, I think that's part of their cultural enrichment would be to to be also you know to have grandparents who have a different way of doing things involved. Yeah. I think that's actually great, and um, you know, like I, I guess you know sometimes um, we as the kids, um, you know, parent kids, right, don't love being criticized by our parents. Um, you know, we're still not um, so, you know, if, if, if that kind of grandparenting could be done, you know, without, um, like extra commentary, <laughs> I guess that right. would be my advice, right. but I would certainly do, still do it. Another question I have here, um, so much of a parenting can involve giving up on some of the ways that we were raised because the world changes so quickly. Do you have any thoughts? For example, the questioner says, A lot of my childhood was spent outdoors, but my kids have a different understanding of wildlife and outdoor space because we live in a metropolitan area. So do you feel Uh, that you've had to just kind of relinquish things that you thought uh, that you sort of had taken for granted would be part of your parenting because of the world itself? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a great example, like, and and in a way much more profound than the, like the one that I have in the, my mind is, is sports and like hockey, Mm -hmm. right? And um, it's just been, it's, you know, I really loved playing hockey as a kid. I still love playing hockey and um, it's a tough thing to do in New York. You have to be really committed and it's almost like getting out into nature is, you know, getting out into nature and playing hockey are both difficult things to do in New York. Um, and I don't, you know, and I, I still am wrestling with that, you know, cause I, I, I haven't given up the dream of my kids playing hockey because I think they would really enjoy it. Um, and, you know, but I would be overcoming like both logistical hurdles and their resistance. Um, and so then, and so you're always kind of like trying to figure out like, okay, am I willing to give up, um, you know, hockey in order to live right. in New York City? Yes, you know, but right. do I have to? Mm, probably, but I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I don't know the answer. Interesting. I mean, I think um, one of the things that's really interesting about the hockey section is how you, um, I think the discussion that you have with Emily about, about sports in the book is extremely, but it's like, it's really funny in a way, but it's also kind of profound and it kind of taps into a lot of, um, you know, gender issues and sort of, you know, your own childhood and her view of, and it's sort of like these clashing views of Mm -hmm. sports becomes kind of a a cipher for all these other things. And so 
I, did you, I mean, did you find that difficult to, you know, in some ways it's unfashionable, right? Like it's unfashionable to say like, because they're boys, they should play sports. So, I mean, that's another thing that I found kind of brave about the book is you just kind of, you said some things that are, are really not, and I know that you know that they're, that they're not really that um, fashionable in the mainstream and, you know, gender essentialism is not really uh, smiled upon, but it comes up for you and it comes up with sports. And so you, you wrote it in. I thought that was really interesting. So... Thank you. I mean, I, I, I guess, yeah, yeah, but like, I, that doesn't feel that brave to me, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, if you, if, well, like in, in, you know, a few zip codes, right. Right. But like, if you look at like mainstream American culture, like the NFL, you know, I mean, it's not, we're not really living in that world where, no. um, you know, yeah. We're not. Yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty medium. <laughs> It's true, but it's so interesting when Emily, uh, there's a funny thing where you say, Emily, it turned out, thought that sports were implicated in date cult or uh, rape culture rather. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, this is a, uh, you guys are really um, coming from a completely different place at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she, she, I mean, you know, that's it. Like, I was going to pick you up. Whose mom is that? Whose mom is that? Max and Patrick. Max and Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, 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 he saw that you were a mom. Yeah, I know it shows. It just, yeah. it, it just, it just, you know. Um, it. Sorry, what were you we talking about? You were talking about, you know, sports and gender. Sorry, oh, I, yeah, I, I mean, you started talking about the, the hockey yeah. stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, I, I do, you know, I, yes, Emily, like, I think, I, you know, a nice thing about and maybe this, I don't know how much this comes through in the book, but like, it wasn't like, you know, Emily said those things and I think thinks those things, but she was totally supportive of, right, of course. trying to get them to play sports. And, and, you know, she, she didn't have like an ideological commitment to it um, in the way that I maybe did, but um, and in fact, the opposite, but she, she, you know, she, she's a, she was a competitive swimmer. So it's not like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, th- I, I think we're, oh, there's, I'll ask you, this is quick because we only have a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, what books should a parent recommend to his children? Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's quick. Uh, Name a few uh, titles. <laughs> <laughs> At what age? Um, it doesn't say, and doesn't I don't say. know. Let's see if there's, let's I'll, see. If I'll just tell you. No. Well, you know, I can only tell you what Raph is reading right now. He's reading Dory Phantasmagory. Um, and he loves those. Those are... Well, you were reading it this morning, and what are you reading right now? George O'Connor? What is, what's the name of the author? I don't know. Oh, it's the dragon book? He reads these um, Greek, um, these like Greek mythology books um, that are amazing, and he loves them. And before that, he was listening to a podcast called Greeking Out, mm. which I really um, recommend <laughs> for, you know, five and six and seven year olds. It's a little scary. And, you know, there's like people go blind because of Medusa and stuff, but it, you know, the, it's very entertaining and Rafi listened to many, many hours. It's a favorite road trip entertainment yeah. in our family. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Hi everyone. I'm just coming back on screen for our final thoughts. We love to end with a book recommendation here at the end. Um, so don't let me interrupt if you wanted to close on a final thought, final words. Keith. Oh, um, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. I, have, I just want to say this was when I was on my terrible country tour, um, you know, four years ago, and I uh, dreamed of talking about uh, parenting. Um, this was it. This is my dream come true. So thank you for, thank you for having me. Um, Well, thanks on behalf of Politics and Prose. We've had a great time. What a riveting, um, really heartfelt hour. Um, Our thanks to Keith Gesson, Megan K. Stack, and our audience out there for your thoughtful questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this incredible programming, and we wouldn't be able to host these events without the book sales to support them. So please follow the link in the chat to grab your copy of Raising Raffi, The First Five Years, or just visit us at politics-pros.com. And while you're there, feel free to check out our full calendar of 
events, for more offerings. Um, we'll have a busy, great summer headed into fall. We hope to see you soon or connect with you virtually. Um, so from our shelves to yours, thanks again. And we hope you're out there staying strong, staying safe, and of course, staying well-read. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.